Hey guys, it's Mike here. Today we're gonna to talk about microservices architecture. I'm gonna walk you through all the concepts, all the patterns that you need to know uh, about microservices. It's a very common uh, architecture these days. A lot of companies, cutting edge companies, they are moving away from monolithic approach, which is a one huge big application and they're moving away and they're adopting uh, microservices architecture. It's very common these days. It's really important as a software developer, you keep your knowledge updated about microservices and uh, you know learn as much as you can about it. But in this video, my goal is to actually give you pretty much everything you need to know about microservices and start working with them. So before we get into microservices specifically, uh, we need to understand how monolith application or monolithic applications work. So in short, we say monolith applications, which means one big giant application written in, I don't know, ASP.NET with, um, I don't know, maybe Ruby, PHP, old languages. So it's a one huge application that basically contains all the business logic, GUI, back end, front end. So everything is, is in one place. Well, there's a lot of disadvantages and problem with that model, which is a basically client and then you have backend and then you have a database. So it's a like a three tier application, very common in back in, I don't know, maybe uh, up to even 2000, uh, maybe 13, 14, those models were really, you know, they were everywhere. But uh, it's been a few years that companies are, you know, uh, really moving away from monolith architecture because it comes with a lot of issues. Although microservices, they provide a lot of advantages, a lot of good features. Uh, they are, of course, you know, probably a bit more complex at the beginning. But as you get more hands on experience, you will feel, you know, really comfortable uh, working with microservices. So monolith applications, they have a, a very big, uh, again, giant application that puts everything in one place. So that comes with a big, big price. So the first thing is, as a developer, if you join a new team, you have to start understanding the entire monolith application, which is a really difficult job. And codes are all over the place, different versions, different components, very complex environments. The next thing is they are really, really hard to test because you want to test a small feature. Um, you have to, you know, basically bring the system to the state you can actually test it. So testing monolith big applications is really difficult. Well, what if you want to change a, a part of the application? What if you want to take the new development to the production? So what happens in that case, you have to basically, uh, you know, um, build a file. We have to deploy the entire application, new version to the production. So that comes again with a lot of other issues that for every single deployment, you have to compile and basically create the new version for the entire application, which is a very, very bad thing to have. It makes developing new features and uh, basically put them in, uh, in the production, very, very tough job. One thing fails, the entire application fails. So it's not, they're not fault tolerant. So let's uh, review an example, a company like Netflix, like Airbnb, like Expedia. Yeah. So imagine those companies, they had one big application that they wanted to maintain and make available, you know, around the globe 24 seven, 365. So that's a very, very uh, tough job. How do you scale this system? What if overnight your application becomes very successful? So are you going to buy just the bigger servers and you're going to hit a limit of Basically, hardware won't do good for you. You won't be able to scale. At the end of the day, basically, you are scaling vertically. You're not scaling horizontally. You're not able to basically distribute the traffic between few computers. Basically, there's no distributed computing. So usually, uh, all monolith applications, uh, they're really tightly coupled uh, you know, with, uh, with the machine, with all the other components. Imagine you're working on a .NET application, very big application that takes like, I don't know, six minutes to just when you hit the start to just compile and, you know, start. So it's a very heavy application. And imagine you want to change one library. Imagine you want to upgrade, I don't know, data grid version from 3.6, whatever in specific, uh, I don't know, component or vendor to a better model. So there's a lot of pieces once you start changing that thing, the entire application will fall apart, right? If you've done this, you know what I'm talking about. This is a big problem. Once you change one thing, 
it will affect the other things. So one very best practice in software engineering is build things that are orthogonal, right? Orthogonality talks about when you change something, you don't want to affect other things. Imagine, let's think about the radio. When you change the station, you don't want the volume to be affected or vice versa, right? So they're completely, uh, they have different functions. A lot of uh, monolith applications, they're really tightly coupled. So components are really tight together. So if you change one component, it's gonna break the other component and the entire application starts failing. So that's one thing we talked about testability, we talked about deployment, we talked about uh, maintenance, CDCI. Let's say uh, you wanna build um, continuous integration and continuous delivery you know, pipeline where you uh, develop and it goes through the test automatically and it goes to production if it's okay. So uh, these days you have to go through this cycle really, really fast, right? Because you have to deliver value, you have to deliver new features to your customers, right? But if it takes you like two years to build a feature on top of your monolith application, that is a very, very um, big problem. So uh, another thing is adopting a new technology. It's very, very uh, hard in monolith architecture because imagine uh, you want to, you know, change uh, your, you know, language, programming language, you want to move away from PHP, which is an old language, to something very modern. Let's say you want to develop in Node.js, right? So, uh, you or you want to develop with, I don't know, uh, Spring Boot. So, changing that technology, it's going to affect the entire monolith application since you're relying on one technology. So, adopting technologies, it's very difficult. So, you have to basically redevelop and redesign the entire system. And, of course, if you're going, for example, with Node.js, which is good, let's say, for one feature of your product, then you have to stick with that because you cannot run 20 different languages under one application, which is, a, again, another disadvantage of monolith applications. But, of course, they're easier to develop than distributed applications, which we're going to talk about right now. But uh, uh, monolith, basically, applications are kind of, they're coming to the end. Uh, now we have to start thinking about microservices architecture since programs can talk to each other through API so we can actually make use of those uh, good stuff and start building modern applications and pick the right technology for the feature that we're building. If you're building a, uh, for example, chatting system for your website, uh, you can actually have a component separate thing that runs on Node.js, which is a good for non-blocking uh, basically use cases, right? If you are doing some analysis and you need some data, to, uh, you need some tools to basically uh, analyze your data, you might want to use Python. You're free to use this in microservices architecture because uh, microservices, it's the same application from the user's perspective, right? If I go to the e-commerce website, uh, the look of the website, the feel of the website, it's the same feel. But behind the scenes, what's happening there are, uh, you know, small computers, right? Let's say there are uh, many computers behind the scenes. They're networked. They're in different locations around the globe, but they work well together, which they act as a one monolith application, right? So it's about orchestration. It's about working those small components together to basically accomplish the same concept as monolith, but the, but the architecture is different. What is a distributed system? Distributed system is basically, is a, it's a system whose components are located on different uh, networks and different computers, but basically they coordinate through messaging architecture by passing messages to each other. That happens through API. So it's a very basic explanation of uh, distributed computing. Imagine, uh, for example, Netflix, right? having many, many computers around the globe that they serve, you know, content to people who want uh, to watch a series or documentaries, whatever. And basically they can serve, they can act as one system, but they're not running on one single machine. Imagine next Netflix wanted to serve millions of millions of uh, people to one or two or three machines. That's impossible to do, right? So the mar uh, microservice architecture is kind of a requirement moving uh, forward. It's not uh, an option. So uh, 
But why do we want to build systems in market microservice uh, manner? And uh, I want to explain two things that you need to really uh, have a good understanding of. One of them is loosely coupled components, right? What is loose coupling, right? And the second one, I'm going to explain right now. And the second one is basically high cohesion. So loose coupling, right? It's basically when we want to build components that they're not affecting each other, we call loose coupling. For example, in our e-commerce website or in our Netflix um, um, example, when you have a service that does the recommendation of movies that you want to watch and you want to keep this separate as your billing or as your uh, you know, monitoring component or as, you, as your content delivery uh, system. So there are smaller components which they're loosely coupled, which means if they're small right, and focused on one thing right, and they do one thing really well, they're loosely coupled. You can basically remove them from the system and replace them with a better version instead of maintaining and redoing the entire application. So loosely coupled components is the biggest feature of distributed application. Of course, it comes with complexity in development. They're more complex than normal monolith applications, but the benefit is huge. Basically, you can have components that they work independently. They're very small. They do one thing, but they're focused on one thing and they do it really, really well. The second thing is high cohesion. So your billing component should be only focused on things that is related to billing, right? Let's say you build a class in Java, you build a class in C Sharp, in Python, whatever language. If that class is connecting to database, updating your customer information, and at the same time, the same class is sending email notifications to the customer regarding their billing information, that's a red cross, that's a bad design. So that's not a loosely coupled system, right? So we always want to uh, categorize the systems around uh, business capabilities, right? So business operations, it's a good boundaries. It's kind of defines your zones, right? So, okay, I have a zone that it's called uh, customer management. It's probably, it needs to only be focused on customer related stuff. It doesn't need to be involved in credit card, for example, processing, or it doesn't need to be involved in my uh, monitoring tools, right? So you always want to build components that they're very small as possible, right? As, as small as possible, but uh, they're focused in one thing. So don't put all the functionalities in one basket. Try to make them separate based on business requirements, right? So in, uh, for example, on e-commerce website, you have an ordering system, uh, right? And then let's say you have an inventory system and then uh, you have a customer system, right? So uh, your customer system, which is basically in charge of checking the customer's, let's say credit limit, when you go Amazon, when you want to charge, when you want to pay for a product, that's basically a component that's handling all the credit card transaction, all your points that you received as a loyal customer, for example, if you are carrying a credit card. Uh, it's just handling that piece. That component or basically customer component or co credit card component has nothing to do with recommendation engine that you see, for example, on Amazon's website. So different pipelines bringing information and interaction to a one place, but from different resources, right? So the system is loosely coupled. Well, let's take a look at uh, microservices architecture benefits, right? So what's the benefit? So CMAC, you told me that this is gonna take me, uh, you know, more effort in terms of development because distributed systems, since they're not running on one system, it's gonna be more challenged and you will see why shortly. But what's the benefit of distributing all these traffic, all these components in different machines and around the globe? So the first thing comes to mind, uh, comes to mind is basically a scaling issue, right? So, well, uh, when it's time for people to watch Netflix at night, when people start turning on their Netflix, so Netflix starts scaling the system, you know, as much as they need to basically to keep up with the demand, right? They're not running on one machine. Again, it's a distributed computing system 
it, it can scale the components as needed. Imagine Amazon.com on Black Friday or on Prime Day, they wanna, they're receiving a lot of orders, right? And they need to uh, basically scale only the checkout service. They don't need to scale the entire system, right? That only small component, which is, for example, uh, let's say ordering system or uh, cart uh, component where you go and pay for the product. So all they need to do, they just need to scale that component, not the entire system. So the first advantage of microservices is basically scaling becomes very, very easy. The second thing uh, is replacing a component. Let's say something is broken, right? You want to replace it with a new version becomes very easier because you are just replacing a small piece of a big application that is independent. It's a microservice, right? It has its own isolated environment. It's running, it's talking to its own API and database. There's nothing tightly coupled to this machine. So it's very easy to change and basically have CDCI continuous deployment and continuous integration cycle. You can make this process as fast as you want to. The next thing is different teams around the globe. Let's say you have a team in Asia, you have a team in America, and then you have a team in Africa. They're working on one application, right? But they're working on different services. Team A in America it uses, uh, let's say, Node.js and MongoDB and Angular, right? Which is their tech stack since it's a service-oriented approach, right? It's not tightly couple all the components. Uh, they're working on tech stack. Team B has its own tech stack. They're working on Python and some analytics application and maybe a NoSQL database like, a, I don't know, a DynamoDB, right? That's their tech stack. Team C in Africa, they are doing their own, uh, let's say, maintaining their own application using Ruby, maintaining their own service. So different teams can work on different projects so they can move faster. They don't have to wait for each other, right, to finish their work because all these services, they are communicating through API, through most likely a REST uh, full API, which is an architectural style on top of protocol HTT. It's got meta get, put, post, delete. If you uh, are interested in learning more about uh, REST API, watch my uh, Spring Boot application. And uh, I have an expense tracker full application, which I, where I walk you through all the steps that you need to know in order to build a REST pool and connect it to a to GUI. So different teams can work on different part of the application independently, right? And they can deploy their own application to their production as long as they're exposing an API and it's active to serve other services. So it becomes really beautiful uh, because they can pick their own technology, right? They're not, they don't have to stick with one technology because they picked it 20 years ago, right? They can just move fast. Components become smaller. So the code base is usually small. Let's say a few hundred lines, right? And it's a basically CRUD application, insert, delete, remove, search, right? Plus some business complexity. So basically the teams are managing smaller code base, right? They can move when they're smaller, they can move faster. They can bring new features to market very fast, right? Uh, instead of waiting uh, for other teams and they can have their own uh, pipeline. They can test their own API. They can test their own microservice without being dependent on other services, right? They just need to make sure this API acts, uh, you know, the same. Uh, so basically you can create pipeline, you can automate your tests, run the code, let it go through the pipeline. If it's successful, it will go to the production. So overnight, the website, the API changes. So different teams can work on different components. Bringing new technology to the team becomes very easier because you're like a team of five or six or like Amazon says, two pizza. Uh, it's a basically small team that brings everything. They, you know, work really closely. They don't have to wait for time zones. They don't have to wait for many approvals or bureaucracy or things like that. So teams can move faster, which is a great thing. Uh, the next thing is availability, right? These days, availability, it's crucial for any, for, uh, you know, pretty much all businesses. If you're not available, if you're not in the market, uh, you're not going to make money, right? So businesses like uh, Netflix, they don't want to go down. So fault tolerance, right? Being available all the, the time 
it's a big feature of uh, microservices. It's an advantage of microservices because systems are distributed. If something happens to a West region of the United States, they can simply just fail over to the East, North, South, or Asia, or anywhere else in the world, right? They have uh, CDNs, which is basically called uh, distribution networks, right? And distribution networks, basically, it's a content delivery network, uh, which uh, delivers the content through cloud, like AWS, faster to the end user. So if you're watching Netflix on the other side of the uh, you know globe, then you will be served with a point that is closer physically on, uh, on the map, closer to your location. So you will have a better performance. So latency uh, is another thing that's a, that's a problem, but microservices basically provide a, a really good latency because if uh, millions of people are coming to the network, for example, for Netflix, they are contacting different servers, right? So they are not coming to one single machine, which eventually is gonna go down because it's not gonna be able to scale as fast as they want to. And of course, again, you, as I said, you can upgrade the hardware, but at one point, you are gonna hit the point that you're not gonna be able to scale your hardware. You can test it faster, you can deploy it fast, you can maintain it easily. The code base is smaller, bringing new technologies is here. It's very good and friendly for Docker technology, for contain containerized uh, technologies like Docker microservices. Of course, microservices come with uh, a lot of challenges and I'm gonna walk you through those challenges and you guys can think about it. Uh, let me know what you think. Uh, ask me all those questions. I'll try to uh, answer them as soon as possible. The first thing we need to think about uh, when we're working with microservices, it's our database layer, right? And I'm gonna tell you why in a second. Because we do have very good technologies like Spring Cloud, which I will be building a tutorial on Spring Cloud, Netflix, how to develop microservices using Spring Boot, and um, I'm, I'm still working on it. But for now, let's talk about um, the back end first. So transactions in databases, right? Transactions in databases, in normal databases, when you build monolith application, it's basically asset. So, uh, since in microservices or distributed systems, you are not running on one single machine, transaction management becomes very challenging, right? So before we continue this route, let me introduce you to two concepts. One is called eventual consistency and one is called strong consistency. In a strong consistency, you basically expect the system to respond to you, to send you a data back very accurately. If I'm writing a data to a database and immediately I make a call to database, I'm expecting to see the result immediately. That is called strong consistency. The second one is called eventual consistency, which you can guess. I'm sending a data to server, right? And I can tolerate a little bit, you know, like inaccuracy in terms of data retrieval. And eventually data becomes consistent after a few seconds probably, right? So if I immediately write and then ask a database to send me the data back, if it's eventual consistency, I might not see my updated post immediately. But if it's strong consistency architecture, I will be expecting to see the result immediately as soon as I send the data to the application, right? So this is the difference between strong consistency and eventual consistency. Well, so why don't we just always go with uh, strong consistency? Because it sounds accurate, right? Well, here's the... Uh, Here's the downside. You are basically uh, compromising on latency, on performance. And here's the reason why. Imagine you send data, right? And you're expecting to see the data as soon as you make a call. So basically this means you have to lock the database, right? You have to make a synchronous call to a database to make sure the transaction went through and then unlock the database. Right, so the database will be locked in asynchronous is I'm sorry in synchronous call. So the database will be locked in synchronous call. Right, so synchronous call provides strong consistency, but the price is basically performance and latency. On the other side, uh, eventual consistency, 
uses asynchronous calls, which is very common these days. Asynchronous calls means you send the request and you don't have to wait. You let it go, but eventually it will go to the database. It might take a few seconds. So do you, can you tolerate a little bit inconsistency in your data for a few seconds? If it's a financial service and you cannot tolerate that, so you have to go with, uh, you know, probably strong consistency, or you have to come up with other ways, which we're going to talk about. But for now, uh, now you know strong consistency and eventual consistency in the difference between the two, right? Well, in microservice architecture, we have a concept called single responsibility principle, right? What is single responsibility principle or SERP? It basically tells you if you have two services, order and customer, right? Order is called service A, and this one is called service B, right? First of all, they all the services, they need to have their own database. So if you have a microservice architecture that all the services are talking to a single database, that's a wrong, bad architecture. Because if service A is making a call, it, it puts a lock on a database, right? And then service B wants to contact the database, but it's locked. So the system collapses, right? So that's why you always want to have separate databases, single responsibility per service. So you want to always have separate database for separate services, right? So service A has own database and service B it has its own databases as well. So you always want to separate your databases. That's one. That gives you very flexible environment in case if you want to change your data schema, the only service that will be affected is the service that's actually talking to database A, which is, let's say, uh, your customer service. So customer service has customer DB, right? And the only way to make changes, update custom, that, that database is just through that API, is just through that service A. So service B cannot directly connect to service A and make changes. Make sure you understand this. Service B cannot directly contact service A and update the database. Basically, that brings a lot of issues to the table. So you always want to make sure you have separate databases and they communicate through API. If B needs to update something in, on A side, it needs to make a call to the service and ask the service to go to make the changes to the underlying database, right? Using that database model, which basically is a separate model, will help you, will give you a lot of flexibility. It's loosely coupled. If you change one thing in database A, Service B is not going to be affected, so you're just good, right? But having everything under one database, if you change one data schema, it might break other services, which is going to eventually take down the entire application. So now we learned about um, eventual consistency and strong consistency. Now I want to uh, talk about two major, two very important patterns in database transactions in microservices. Now that, that we talked about single responsibility model, you need to know that every single service can use the, the database that is really appropriate for that use case. For example, if you're building a search functionality and you want to use Elasticsearch, uh, by all means, you can go ahead and use Elasticsearch for your application for that small service. If uh, you're building a, you know, uh, let's say user profile and you want to go with NoSQL, you can go with a NoSQL database like MongoDB. If you are uh, building something relational and you need relational database, you can use it. But this comes with, again, um, another you know issue that uh, when you scale, then you're running like, let's say, five different database technologies. So you need to uh, make sure you have enough people uh, in your team that they know the technology really well, they're comfortable with uh, all these type of databases. So updating and knowledge becomes a little bit issue and challenging. So let's go back to our uh, you know, transaction management, which we're going to talk about two famous patterns um, and basically consensus, right? So consensus, basically database transactions are really tricky to implement in distributed systems. And uh, basically each node uh, has uh, you know, some information about the transaction. Let's say you go to e-commerce website, you uh, place an order, right? So the order service is going to go ahead and, uh, you know, place the order. And at the same time, the customer uh, service needs to go ahead and check the limit and charge the client uh, credit card. 
Well, what if during that time that we are processing the, the order, the everything goes through, the user gets charged, and then the, the service makes another call to, uh, uh, you know, to inventory system to ship the product to you. And then the shipping service says, or inventory service says, oh, sorry, we're out of stock. We don't have this product. Well, what just happened, you just charged the customer client's uh, credit card. You, you know, did some work, but in the middle of the work, uh, basically the transaction cannot be completed because the, the orders, uh, the product is out of stock immediately when someone else just ordered the last one. So how do you do? Since they're not running under one application, here's a big challenge. We need the mechanism to basically um, settle down the transaction to see if we have to commit or abort the transaction. Which one should we do? This called consensus, right? So in microservices, this called consensus. We have two uh, famous pattern. The first one is called saga. And the second one called two-phase commit, right? Let's start with two-phase commit. A conductor, right, tells all the services, hey, prepare for an order. So it goes to some preparation, every single service. When they all say we are ready, then tells a signal, sends a signal to all the microservices to commit the transaction. So it's two phases, right? So it first prepares and then it commits. So it's two phases. Well, uh, Mr. Hope has this, uh, you know, example of Starbucks that he basically helps us understand this model, you know, clearly. So he says, imagine you go to Starbucks to order coffee, right? So you go to the line, you wait there, and you have the money in your hand, and you tell the uh, person, okay, I want to order cafe latte tall, and you wait, right? So usually what happens, you give the order, and then you move forward, right? And it's a basically asynchronous call. You don't have to lock the transaction until it becomes available, until your coffee is ready. So you might be ordering something simpler than myself, right? So you might be ordering just, you know, dark coffee. So there's no preparation for your coffee. However, you are, you know, waiting behind me in the line. But since your order is simpler, it becomes available before my order. And that's an asynchronous call. We send the request. We don't know how long it's going to take and we'll get the response as soon as it's ready, right? So this is an asynchronous model in a Starbucks. But uh, he talks about what if every single person that you go to the cashier and you say, I want this cafe latte tall and you hold the money in your hand and then you wait for the team to prepare your coffee. When they give you the coffee, you give them the money. So the transaction, basically you prepare them, you let them know what you want, but you basically lock the entire queue behind you, people waiting in the line and you are waiting basically for the coffee to arrive. Once your coffee is ready, you exchange the money with the coffee. That's two-phase commit model, right? It's not asynchronous. So what's the benefit? It's again, it comes with strong consistency. You wait, it's a synchronous call. You wait until the transaction is either committed or aborted, right? It locks up the entire queue. It's, it doesn't float, right? If there is a lot, if there's a line behind you, right? They're just going to keep getting the order. The queue is going to grow and then the other team is going to pick the orders from the queue and they're going to process them. That's an asynchronous model, right? Well, so a two-phase commit model, uh, which is strong consistency, it's based on your use case. If you need, uh, you know, definitely have to have that, that's a must. So that's your architecture. But it's usually not recommended because of this sync and locking the database and basically being a bottleneck for your project. So the second pattern, it's called Saga pattern, which is a preferred model. Uh, in Saga pattern, you have two approach, right? So the first approach is called uh, choreography, right? Choreography and the second one called orchestration. So in orchestration model, basically you have a conductor like a music, right? Thing. So uh, the conductor says, okay, Service A, you do this. Service B, you do that. And then at the end, basically, Saga coordinator, Saga conductor decides if we need to settle down, settle the transaction, committed or aborted, right? So basically, a third component, which is a uh, basically Saga conductor, coordinates all the operations between the microservices, right? So 
Uh, this is the first one. The second one is called choreography, which in this model, every single local transaction triggers an event and basically puts it in a message queue, right? Uh, or message boss, or it's basically event sourcing programming, right? In event sourcing programming, like Rx Java or Reactive Java, you have this model. You basically create an event source, you put the uh, basically message in the queue, you say, I, or, I just charged the customer for this product. And then you trigger an event and you put it in the pool. Well, different services, they're subscribed to this message. So they'll be notified automatically that there is a message waiting for them because someone just placed the order and the order service just placed an event in the event queue in the message bar boss, right? And then um, whoever is subscribed to that, which is probably gonna be inventory or other services, they're gonna pick up the message and they're gonna do their own thing. So single transactions trigger events for other services, right? It's a chain. So this is called a choreography model in Saga pattern. Saga pattern is very common. And, uh, but again, uh, think about it. Uh, these are all come with, you know, their own advantages and disadvantages. So you need to understand which one works best for your scenario. One thing I want to mention about databases, in order to scale a database, usually what we do, we use something called read replicas, right? So read replicas were basically the same database version, but they're only readable. You cannot write to them. So that basically offloads a lot of requests to your server. If you are serving your customers read and write functions, you know, through one server or to one service, that's going to put a lot of pressure on the service. So what you do, you build read replicas. And if someone is one, someone wants to read data from your database, you just redirect them. You just send them to the endpoint that is read replica. But if someone wants to write data to your database, you just uh, lead them to your main, basically master database. This is basically uh, putting read replicas is how you scale databases, right? Um, but again, read uh, replicas, they come with another uh, thing, advantage and disadvantage, which um, they are uh, eventual consistency. So basically it's an asynchronous call. It doesn't lock anything. When database gets a chance, we'll send the copy to read replica. So if you need, again, strong consistency, it's an architectural design that you have to make, decision that you have to make, and basically come up with the right decision. So microservices are so useful. Spring uh, Cloud, which is a Netflix library, comes with a lot of awesome things like Eureka's, uh, uh, Zool, Service Discovery, um, uh, Fane, um, and uh, Ribbon, a lot of features that I will be building a tutorial for, for Spring Cloud Netflix, and I'm gonna walk you through all you need in order to build microservices using Spring Boot. So I hope this video was useful. Uh, let me know what you think about all these architecture in the comment section, uh, and let me know your, your, your thoughts. Uh, if you have any question, uh, don't forget to like this video, subscribe to my channel. I hope you enjoyed it, and see you guys soon. Bye.